All right. Well, we might get going. <clears throat> um, well, thank you, everybody, for joining. We've got a fantastic turnout again, so hugely appreciate um, everyone coming along to join us today. Um, uh, as I'd sort of mentioned in the first webinar that we did, um, something that was really important to us, um, I guess, in this entire process for the new package um, that was coming out for SIT and specifically with cookery, um, was that we gathered quite a lot of uh, insights um, from industry, feedback, both from the from the vet sector as well as uh, from the actual workplace industry um, to help better inform what some of the trends are that's going on, what some of the pain points have been, um, and, and to help give us a better insight as to how we we're going to approach this new package and the products. And I mentioned a few of the, the pieces of feedback that we received and some of the findings that we, that we got um, from those validation and consultation processes. Um, and today I've got a few of the members of those uh, collaboration panels joining me today uh, just to have a little bit of a roundtable conversation about what some of those findings were. Um, so we've got Gary Stokes from Tourism Training Australia, Australian Culinary Federation um, and CASCAD Consulting, Vanessa Barnes from Foodlogic and Fazan Contractor, who's the head of culinary at Kenvale College. And so this was a really um, great, I guess, kind of representation of the different elements uh, of industry, those industry bodies that are very heavily involved with industry um, and then as well as the, the vet education space as well. Um, so these three were uh, very instrumental in helping us gather that sort of feedback and give us those insights. So thank you very much, all three of you, for taking the time out to join us today. Um, and very excited to kind of hear your thoughts on some of these as, as we continue. Um, so I'm going to start basically by going through uh, some of those areas that I touched on in a higher level in our first, uh, in the first webinar, um, and then really just open the floor up to be able to get some of those, those insights um, from the horse's mouth as it were. So one of the really big uh, findings that we, that we discovered was that there is a bit of a disconnect that's been created between the RTO education space um, and uh, the actual industry and the needs of industry from what they're looking at from their qualified graduates, what their expectations are, and especially in a post-COVID world, this industry is trying to, to recover so heavily. And so it's forever important um, that we have those properly prepared qualified graduates from the vet space. Um, so I guess the first um, person I'd like to hear from on that uh, would be Gary, um, just to hear from your perspective, what is kind of the emerging trends with that and what are some of the actions that we can, we can put forward Thanks very much, Luke, and it's great to see so many familiar names and faces that have joined uh, the webinar today. So um, welcome, everybody. Um, and also, there's going to be a bit of a question and answer session at the end, and this is a great opportunity for you guys to, to jump in and pop some questions in um, as we go through, and we'll, we'll hopefully be able to get through those at the end. So thanks very much, Luke, for that question. I think the the... The disconnect between industry and the RTO and the training package, there's several moving parts within all of that. Uh, industry is looking for job-ready graduates from, from training providers, and training providers are looking to get job-ready candidates into those uh, facilities and, and environments as quick as possible. But I think the 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 uh, I, I want to sort of bring in the point of industry currency at this this point of time as well for the trainers it's important for the trainers to also understand what is in the industry at the moment and what the current trends are what are the requirements and also thinking about what skills and capabilities the students have when they're, they're completing their courses and this is why the work-based training component of the the qualifications are, are, is really important particularly in hospitality and and cookery so i think the the opportunity to engage more with industry by the rto and have a better understanding of what those expectations are so that they can provide uh real skills uh in in that learning environment when the students actually go out and jump into to their work programs or, or um, jobs that they've found or, or applying for. Okay, awesome. And have you found, I guess, from, from the, the lens, and this could be a, a good opportunity for you to weigh in as well, Fazan, um, from the, the lens either from 
what industry are seeing come through or as a conscious point from the vet space, what you are trying to prepare students with outside of just, you know, ticking boxes of the training package, but actually knowing what they're going to be getting into when they do go out into, into the, edu- uh, into the workforce. Um, are there any, you know, specific considerations that, that are being taken on board for that in how you're preparing students? I think for us, it's uh, again, welcome to everyone. And, and thanks for joining us uh, today. Uh, for us as an industry or for a training organization, it's, it's very important to be able to kind of realign the study patterns and the outlook and not focus it so much as the student being the end user, but focusing it more on the industry being the end user, right? Because yes, we do train students and educate students, but at the same time, we train them with the purpose of being ready for industry. So for us, it's more about giving them real world skills and training them in a method that actually prepares them to go out into the industry and and make a positive contribution, so to speak. But with the with the disconnect, there is a slight uh, disconnect in between what industry expects and what students' perceptions are of what industry accepts. And for us, it's all about trying to bridge that gap as well as we can, you know, by giving them a more holistic approach to the learning process. Awesome, thank you. Um, any anything, I guess, to to add to that, Gary? Are you experiencing anything? I- on the other side of it yeah i i i think also rtos need to be really focused on the students as their uh, as their customers and trying to get the students to understand or actually asking the students what are their expectations of industry when they when they actually join the industry so industry is dictating back to the rtos and the the training providers and the developers saying this is what we want but how is that being interpreted in the classroom to the students or the learners and getting some feedback from the learners to say we actually understand what industry wants and be able to um, build our skills so that we do understand the industry better when we when we um venture into that that space a student going through commercial cookery or hospitality uh, may have um, over expectations or higher expectations of what the industry is going to provide them Uh, it's it's not just about getting a job and it's about having the skills to be able to perform that job a, a, a new graduate in an industry is not going to be expected to do the budget forecast for the next 12 months in a restaurant or a, a hospitality venue, but a better understanding of the skills and knowledge that's required for them at that entry level point, or if they're already working in the industry, how can they further develop their skills to take on those higher managerial skills um, that they can develop over time? I think there's a little bit of a disconnect between student expectations as well as industry expectations. And I think the NLTA has got an opportunity to massage that a little bit better. Yeah, yeah. I suppose, I mean, on... On that, then, that does, you know, to the point that, that you're making about, um, you know, industry currency for trainers really to to solve both those or help be a conduit to, to solving both those sort of sorts of issues, both from the, you know, the student expectation perspective and industry. Um, trainers are in a key position to be that effective conduit, both in the way that they're approaching how they're, how they're training, having their finger on the pulse with, um, with, uh, with industry, um, are you finding, and, and actually I was talking to you about this the other day, Ness, are you finding that from what you're seeing in how you're interacting with, um, you know, different elements of the industry in the vet space, that um, you know, trainers are embracing, um, I guess, that that level of kind of passion and dedication towards being current with industry and, and wanting to, to prepare students in that fashion, or is there still a disconnect in that respect? So, thank you. It's kind of a bit of a three-prong approach, this question, because, you know, I've given quite a bit of thought to it and it's it's a difficult one because I feel like the industry doesn't really even know what they want at this point. Like, I don't think they really understand what their expectations are and they're so varied. So it kind of creates a lot of confusion and and um, a lot of pressure gets put back on these students and the and the trainers as well. 
So I, I kind of see it from two sides, but to answer your question, I feel that um, I feel that over the last three years that we've really picked up the standard of, of excellence across the training sector when it comes to the support and what the empowerment that the trainers have been giving to the students. I feel they're preparing them a lot better than what I had seen previously to, to even COVID. I, I don't know what the gear shift has been, but I've been really um, inspired to, to see it, to be honest. Okay, that's awesome. And so, well, and, and that, I suppose, has been definitely summing in in the past where, and maybe this was, you know, purely a pre-COVID um, situation, but that there had been concerns from industry um, that through whatever, through the mechanism of the training package or whatever, that the skills that, you know, students were being prepared with was not necessarily what they were after. But I suppose that is something that um, could be a completely different picture now as well with an industry that's been so decimated over the last couple of years and is trying to recover and is so desperate for, um, you know, for staff. And I think um, it's the way we treat our staff as well, Lukey. I mean, you know, we, we used to take, I believe, across the industry, and this is very generalised, but I feel like we took our workers for granted. I feel now that the, the kitchens or the management within these businesses are actually appreciative a lot more for the um, for the workers or the team that they're building for their business because we have such a crisis when it comes to the to the people the people power there's just nothing out there. Yeah, well, and to so on that then as well to your point um, the other day, Gary, um, there is now a huge opportunity for trainers to be able to continue that industry currency because of the availability for them to be able to expose themselves out to different professional settings because the industry is so desperate for, you know, assistance. Yeah, there's a lot more opportunities now for, for the hospitality sector. And when I say that, I, it's it's a, the broad hospitality, commercial cookery, hospitality, Asian cookery, the, the whole gambit. Uh, there's a, a, a greater need uh, for, for professionals to work in that industry. Prior to COVID, uh, trainers would often say it was hard for them to find casual employment. It was hard to find uh, a job. You know, the, they were uh, just didn't have the time the, that was available to them. Our industry is hurting so much still. Uh, there is still a lot of opportunities out there for casual shifts uh, that, that's, that's available. And I think it's a great opportunity for our trainers to, to dip their toe back into the real world of, of the industry and get current skills and update the, with what's going on at the moment. Even, um, you know, pubs, clubs, hotels that were always in the past seen as a, uh, I don't know, not an area that was possibly a little bit difficult to break into. There or every sector of the industry is crying out for staff. It should be easily available to pick up some extra shifts. And that is going to give the trainer a real taste of what's happening in our industry. Menus have changed, food costing has changed, staffing has changed, uh, everything has changed. And okay, it's the COVID was the, the mechanism that's changed all that, but that's our current environment. What, what industry needs is vastly different now to what it needed prior to COVID. The, the um, emerging fantastic trend that's in our industry uh, at the moment, which I hope stays and grows, is the availability of Australian products on our menus and, and sourcing ingredients uh, and using those ingredients and being able to... to uh, have those and use those and implement those into the menu. And I see some great creative ways of, of recognising that within industry. And these are all the skills that the trainers can bring back into their classroom and, and excite the students about because I feel the students or the learners want to hear about the industry from somebody that was being in the industry last week or last month or even the month before, not about somebody that was in the industry 10, 15, 20 years ago because things have changed so much, uh, in particularly in the last three years. And we need to grab hold of that, embrace it, and 
this is what we're doing now, guys, and, and put that out to our students. Yeah. And so what, so Fazan, what would be your, so talking to the industry currency side of it, um, to keep your finger on the pulse, what would be, I guess, your view on that from your lens being in the vet? So similar to what, similar to what Gary is saying, right, at the moment, there's a fantastic opportunity for a lot of trainers and for anyone to get a job in hospitality because the industry is hemorrhaging and, and everyone's crying out for staff, right? But at the same time, like Vanessa was saying earlier, I've also noticed the same thing in the fact that people are looking for staff, but they're also willing to spend that little bit of extra tra time training up staff. And they're also very keen to have teachers and lecturers and trainers out there. And I've, I've heard from, I was chatting with uh, people at the Merivale group just this weekend on Friday, Saturday, and uh, they're keen to have trainers and lecturers there because of the fact that it's kind of like a conduit in between what industry wants and what message needs to get across to the learner or the student. So it's an amazing way for that industry currency to then be fed back into the students and the students can get, like Gary said earlier, firsthand experience of new trends, of what's happening, of what the industry is looking for, what's out there. And because our industry is so diverse, I mean, there might be a student that wants to work in the fine dining venue. There might be a student that wants to work within an aged care facility. There might be someone that wants to work out at a stadium. And trainers currently at the moment have the opportunity to be able to get some industry currency and work experience across multiple or all of those venues if they if they really want to put the time and effort into doing that. And, and I think it's critically important because of the fact that it helps the trainers stay current with what's actually happening in industry with regards to trends, new food products. Uh, with the new training package coming out, there, there's an introduction of uh, vegan and vegetarian goods. And nowadays, most restaurants or cafes you walk into, they're all uh, working with vegan product, vegan dishes, vegetarian dishes, etc. So if a trainer can actually observe that and see what's happening in the industry, then that gives them an added benefit of bringing that experience back to the learner. You see, because a lot of our students and learners are from international markets for who English is not the first language. A lot of them, this is their first job in the hospitality industry, so it's hard to get work. But all those gaps can be filled by the trainer giving them tips or tricks of the best way to approach the industry, the best way to try and get an interview. I mean, we've had an instance here where uh, one of our trainers was out at the Merivale group teaching and doing industry currency. And uh, through that, a couple of our students got jobs within the Merivale group, right? Because of the fact that the head chef there just loved the interaction they had with the trainer and they started chatting and said, hey, if you have some students who are interested in working at the new Allianz Stadium, we'd love to have them on board. And so there's multiple advantages to it. I think it's, I think to, to sum it up, the trainers need to look at it, not only from a point of ticking a compliance box, from, but from a point of a more holistic approach where, where it's great for them, but it's also great knowledge and feedback they can give to their students, which, which helps yeah. them grow in their careers. Well, I'm just going to quickly, just while we're on this, because I think it's very relevant, um, Dean has, has put a comment in the chat. Um, so based on everything that we've just been saying about industry currencies, she said a few things. Um, to unpack with this, the training package um, with the, you know, with the training package and teaching staff can't please, you know, all facets of industry or they can't cover all facets, um, you know, of industry. And as you just said, there's a lot of different types of, you know, restaurants or, or um, you know, organizations that you can be involved in. Um, and regarding industry currency, you know, it's, it's difficult to be able to get a job to justify, you know, the, the, the first job as the, the teacher and, you know, a potentially fair comparison of what other industry needs to have that level of involvement. And since there is such a broad spectrum of, you know, the cookery industry that you could get involved in, how do you sort of, you know, cover off all those, those different areas? And Dean, I hope I've interpreted your message correctly. Um, but so to your point with the, the amount of, you know, broad, broad spectrum opportunities that there could be out there. How do you know which is going to be of, of benefit to what you're trying to achieve both for your own industry currency and for what you can hand on to, on to students? So, I mean, uh, when I approach an organization, right, because I do my industry currency also, I, I try and I generally try and approach larger organizations that have multiple venues across 
different kinds of cuisines and different kinds of facilities. And and I'm and I'm and I'm open with them. And I mentioned to them from the get go, saying, you know, I I teach full time and I'd love to do this as part of industry currency, etc. And the interesting that interesting thing that came out of it was one of the head chefs uh, contacted me back and said, you know, we'd love to have you on board. And as you're there and doing your industry currency, etc., would you be able to put an hour aside? And actually, we need to train some of our young chefs that have just come through. And they wanted to break down a whole fish. And I said, yeah, after I help you with service and after we finish our shift or whatever, those young chefs were happy to take in half an hour off their break and spend a half hour with me. And, and we actually worked on breaking down the whole fish, right? So uh, for, for me, the way I see it is it's a two-way street. It's a two-way street in between industry and, and myself, so to speak. And, and I thought that, hey, if they're giving me the opportunity to be there and and spend an hour or spend a couple of days and do a few services with them, I'm more than happy to spend a half hour, an hour, or even two and work with their young chefs in the kitchen on their break time and just show them a few extra skills and, you know, give them a few tips and trips that I can. So that way it works well for both people. And for me, it was great because with this particular company, I could spend time at an aged care facility, but I could also spend time at one of their high-end restaurants. And through that, I was able to bring back a different perspective and a different opinion to my students in the classroom, you know, which, which I see as being beneficial for both, for both parties. And, and like Dean said in his question earlier, it is a broad industry and it's, and it's, it's hard to get across everything, 100% agreed, but it's about taking that first step and, yep. you know, just giving it a go. Awesome, thank you. Um, anything to add on that, either Gary or Ness, before we move on to the next point? I'm, I'm jumping out of my seat to add something, if I may. Oh, please. <laughs> <laughs> I, actually, I actually love what Farzan has just um, contributed to the conversation, but something that I've always felt works really well is to have chefs come in and spend some time with the students in their environment as well. We are in a um, an aging industry, if you will. A lot of chefs are, you know, becoming of the age now where they're, they're wanting to give back and pay it forward and, and really invest in the next generation of chefs coming through. Or hospitality, it's not just chefs, it's housekeeping. It's, you know, it's the whole, you know, ethos of the of the industry. But there's this, this, this huge amount of knowledge and um, career experience that people would be more than honoured to come into the kitchen and spend some time with the students and 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 to share their knowledge and you know skills with them as well as going out to the fish markets or going to the fruit and veg markets and getting up close and personal with the products and learning firsthand about them. Yeah, yeah. So it's about that knowledge transfer. It's when you've got people who do have the skill set and opportunity to come and assist mm -hmm. and and uh dean I, I agree wholeheartedly in what you say it, it is if you just pick one of the uh qualifications if it was advanced deployment of hospitality there's 33 units in there and it's going to be near impossible to tick all the boxes to to cover off on those 33 units in in industry currency uh commercial cookery there's this uh many of the practical units uh you know the seafood meat fish uh poultry the the new uh unit on vegan vegetarian uh, going into an establishment, uh, granted it would be difficult to tick off on all those boxes, but uh, just preparing the dishes or being involved in, as Fazan and Vanessa said, uh, being involved with that establishment, uh, you, you'd be surprised what you can actually tick off as far as your industry currency on going into a... Um, a cafe, you've got all of your methods of cookery, you've got a range of products you can use. Most establishments now have at least one or two vegetarian, if not vegan options on all of their menus. So you are sort of learning and developing those skills across multiple areas. Uh, if you're working in the kitchen, uh, front of house, you, you cover off on a whole range of things. Maybe not so the uh, the, the budgeting and, and business management and planning and 
rostering, they might may be a little bit more difficult, but there's nothing stopping you jumping in and saying, okay, for um, a, a couple of hours, I can sit with management and just see how they do the rosters and, uh, you know, just get, just uh, have, so you have a better understanding of uh, what industry's demands are at the moment at that at that management level as well. I know a lot of providers now, a lot of establishments now are uh, offering um, a four day work week. So how does rostering go around that? Uh, you know, obviously everyone would like um, the three days of work currently, but how, do, how does the new rostering system do that? And so being exposed and jumping into establishments uh, that are doing those uh, staff retention me measures through different approach to rostering or uh, employee benefits or uh, that would that you can cover off on all those new aspects as well and take that real-time information back into the platform. Excellent, thank you. Um, well, I might just transition across to um, another one of the, the pieces of feedback that we've gotten as well. Um, and this is kind of a, a bit of a two-parter, I guess, um, and also potentially ties in with a question that Marie's just stole, or um, um, some input that Marie's just put into the chat as well. Um, so one th big thing is the all-consuming compliance aspect of what is required to, to be done, you know, when we are training, training students, obviously, first, second, third, and fourth consideration that most RTOs need to need to worry about is well am i ticking all the compliance boxes so that when ask will come knocking we're going to be safe in that regard um and does that then you know impact on the workplace realism or work work-based training realism of of how students are being trained and the fact that some aspects of the um of the training package are written in a way that is so you know theoretically heavy or or even if they are practical tasks they are kind of measuring benchmarks that maybe are not really aligned with or realistic to what should be required you know by the actual industry from from a um a practical and work readiness perspective so for instance as you and i've spoken about gary um you know the work effectively is a cook unit um the metrics of that are all based around um you know the different types of service periods and have you have you worked buffets or have you you know worked afternoon enough afternoon shifts and things rather than really focusing on what is the, the product output of the student it's all based on sort of ticking those those various boxes just about different service periods and so from what marie has written um that a lot of feedback and she's consistently getting from over owners and operators in in the industry is that staff don't have the skill set um that's required and she was saying that um, she thinks that we've got so much focus on theory, um, which I would assume is based on, you know, the training package requirements, um, that that hands-on approach um, is sort of being missed. So to kind of unpack all of that, um, are there, you know, legitimate sort of concerns around the compliance-based requirements that we need to be focusing on and how would you, sort of look at, at trying to overcome that and actually prepare students with that that real level of, of work-based preparation. Open floor to whoever would like to weigh in. Can I, um, can I, just, add, can I just respond to that, um, if you don't mind? Sure. So from, a, from an industry perspective, I feel that if you're open and very honest and transparent with them as to where the student is at, I feel like the industry has come to understand that they need to meet the student there. You, you can't, the days of putting these students into these high pressure areas and expecting them to deliver skills that a fourth year apprentice or a commie or someone who's been trained at that level, uh, they, they're gone. Um, you know, we, we've got social media and there's naming and shaming and there's all these things going on now where people can't hide if they treat people poorly. So. I think that we need to be, I think that the industry needs to understand where the, the student's actual school level is at um, so that they, 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 they don't have these over-exaggerated expectations. Um, yeah. The other thing was 
what was the other part of that I thought was really so so far as spending too much time on the theory side of it I think it's really important I, I really do I feel like without the theory side of it um, the rest of the, the skills don't it just gives them a reference to be able to go back and to, to work on and to to read up on and then you get your on-the-job skills training when you're actually in the workplace I think that's kind of the way it's always worked where I've where I've been involved anyway. Yep. You see, it's uh it's an interesting point, right? That both Marie and and Scott mentioned, and the fact is that uh, it it's always hard to please all of the people all of the time, and you're never going to please all of the people all of the time. But the interesting thing is that uh, there's always going to be a compliance aspect to vocational education no matter how much the package changes or who controls the package, there's always going to be a compliance aspect. And, and we need that compliance aspect to be there as a check and balance system to kind of make sure that people are being honest and things are just happening honestly, right? But at the same time, a lot of it comes down to, to the actual trainer in the classroom and, and their interaction with the students where uh, it just depends on how the trainer or the lecturer structures the day and, and structures the program for the day. And it's about, it's about being able to balance both the knowledge requirements and the practical performance evidence requirements and, and giving the student that perfect blend or good, good mix of, of both worlds where the knowledge side of things is, is particularly important because those are the foundation building blocks that, that is critical for the students to have before they can actually get into the practical side of things and start to create recipes and mix with flavors and textures and tastes, et cetera. But at the same time, it's about talking to them about the, the theoretical side of things and saying, okay, this is what we do from a theoretical aspect, or as we discussed earlier in class, and now we're actually gonna practically demonstrate the same thing. And that's where you actually want the learner to, to mess up, to make a mistake and, and learn from their mistakes, right? Because that then gives them the perfect link to link up what happens practically to what was discussed in the classroom theory based. So I think it's just about having a good, a good balance and trying to create an environment that, that, that facilitates that critical thinking aspect, aspect of it and, and not to keep the class either too practical based or too theory based because you need a good, a good mix of the two to give them a good a rounded learning experience, so to speak. Yeah, mm. and and what uh, quite often I think the baby went out with the bathwater. We uh, over compliance with the the qualifications, the units of competency. Uh, competency based training is collection of evidence that the the candidate can perform uh, that skill or that or has that knowledge. And unfortunately, it's all quantifiable. And a lot of the skills uh, that are taught in hospitality, commercial cookery across the board, uh, the skills, can the student perform this, tick the box, yes, they've done it once, but can they can, can they perform that task? Can they, uh, can they uh, prepare a chicken schnitzel? Yes, they can, but can they do that to industry standards and do that uh, 50 schnitzel during a service period so this is where the industry comes really into play and i think that the work-based training component needs to be quite um in depth so that the the host employer for industry uh, uh work-based training is also of the understanding that the student is still learning so that they're building up their their skills their knowledge is something that happens in the classroom and unfortunately uh, the cost of ingredients, the cost of running practical classes is increasing and some of the RTOs, not all of them, but some of the RTOs cut corners by just having the student perform the absolute minimum task to get through for compliance to tick the box. Many RTOs are on the other side of it where they see the, the strength and the 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 uh, they really want to, have, they have a passion 
and as Vanessa said, they're really pushing the students to perform well and produce great, great dishes. A student doesn't know how to, doesn't perform um, to a fine dining level restaurant quality menu item in one lesson. It's a skill that's built up over time. And yes, they're going to muck up along the way. Yes, they're going to they're going to have a few failures, but they're the building blocks that that support the student to get to that end result. So. I'm really happy to see that many of the RTOs that I've seen uh, err on the sides of a lot of practical sessions, uh, but there's, there's unfortunately, there's a few RTOs where they really do the bare minimum to, to get that student across the line with practical skills uh, and the knowledge they've allowed just to push out and say, um, oh, okay, they, they just do a couple of true and false questions, tick the box and they're done for the knowledge test. And this is where regulators come into play as well. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think, you know, on that, Scott's added in as well, like it comes back to your definition of competence and, and within, you know, the, the bounds of the training packages that we work with, you're absolutely right. The, the notion of competence can be measured as a, well, at the time of observation, did they correctly do this task yes they have thank you very much they're competent um but in the realistic workplace practice perspective and how we want to be um you know training students up to to be is that our version of competence is that they can do this task consistently correctly within the operational requirements and pressures of the actual workplace um and and that is you know kind of the the blue sky end goal that we want to be training people to not just a okay well now with me considering a student as an end user i've seen them do it once i could tick the box in conscience and yeah. my job's done and that's why a few of the units of competency actually have a quantifiable number of occasions that a student needs to do something so can they clean a kitchen vents once and scott's put a uh, comes back to the definition of competence competence the competency-based training is the student is deemed competent at time of assessment. So did you see the student do this three times? Tick, tick, tick. Yes, they're competent at time of assessment. If it goes back to tomorrow, can the student is the student competent tomorrow? We don't know. We haven't seen them do it tomorrow, but they're competent at time of assessment. So I think that where the, the units of competency actually have a quantifiable number, like the work-based training, they have to perform 48 shifts, 36 shifts, 12 shifts, whatever number of shifts it is, as a minimum, you can definitely go over that. And I've seen some RTOs uh, uh, require um, uh, almost double those number of shifts or, or service periods for the student to perform the task. I think that's great because it's really giving the student a, a well, um, a, a good exposure to the industry and allowing them to perform those those tasks several times, not just completing it once or twice and tick the box, yes, they've done it. So they've got some solid groundwork that they can then take to industry or to an employer and say, I did my work-based training over this many shifts or service periods and here's my report and the evidence. So it really builds up their, their skills and their knowledge of the industry. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, I th and I think that also then, you know, a, a, a spanner that often gets thrown in the works and certainly something that we've experienced um, ever since we jumped into um, the cookery space more so than with any other sort of industry or training package that, that we've worked with before is the pressures that are put on trainers from a required hours facilitation, you know, perspective. There is a huge amount of compliance and accessible requirements for units that are within the, the cookery package um which uh, you know it does put a lot of pressure on trainers to be able to to you know observe all of all these students cooking all of these recipes um and you know to the letter of the law of the training package when you start writing um you know assessment requirements for a lot of these i remember the stock sources and soups unit when we first built it for for the old package to the letter of the law of the of the training package requirements of something like 54 separate recipes that technically need to be covered off because you have to do them all, you know, twice. And then you have to do one with a, a you know, special request or dietary requirement thrown in there. And it is, it's a huge amount of 
of worker facilitation that needs to be covered off. Um, mm -hmm. uh, any other thoughts on that, either from Zan or from Ness? Uh, not, on the same, not on the same point there, but uh, I had a point on the question that uh, Rajan's posted. Yes. Uh, where he mentions about the fact that students, when they start off, start off from a junior position and then work their way up. And then it says, however, in all theory tasks, especially in business units, they're required to answer, plan and create tasks, research and hold a meeting, et cetera, at a CEO or appropriate level. Surely is not a very appropriate task to address, but <coughs> sorry. <coughs> the, the important thing to note there is the fact that it's about, yes, 100% when, when, when students are with us or when learners are with us and they go out into the industry, uh, it, it's probably best that they start at a junior position because they can gain skills and experience along the way as they, as they climb the ranks in that particular industry or role. But, and, and that's when they're out on the job in the real world. But when they're with us in, in the training environment or in the learning environment, right, it's about giving them exposure to the possibilities of what's possible and giving them the opportunity to look at things from a different perspective, right? So uh, we recently did a unit here on, on manage, uh, manage and maintain staff relationships or something it was. And it's, it's amazing to see the interaction you get from learners when you talk about how in the ideal world, how an ideal HR person or an ideal CEO would manage conflict and conflict resolution, et cetera, in the workplace. And, and it opens up their eyes and it makes them think that, hey, the next time I'm in that kind of situation, I'm just a little bit more aware and I have a little bit more knowledge and maybe a few more skills to, a, to be able to properly react and engage in that kind of situation, right? So I think it's, it's imperative from a cookery perspective to a management perspective to try and expose students to to as much as we can, because that's what ultimately gives them the necessary tools to be able to perform in the workplace. So even with regards to the fact that 100% agree that yes, they can't learn a dish in a day or they can't learn, we can't expect them to be at a certain level within the kitchen brigade when they've just started off. But it's not always about that. Sometimes it's just about exposing them to the possibilities of what's possible, right? because you want to keep them as a young learner, you want to keep them engaged, you want to keep them motivated, enthusiastic, and, and basically keen for what's ahead. Yeah, absolutely. I hope that answers your question somewhat, Rajan. Yes, and that's something that um, Tourism Training Australia agitated in the uh, consultation process of the SIT training package was to try and move away from putting units of competency in there that uh, that uh, uh, the assessment requirements is to plan and implement a particular process. So at a management level, it's typical to implement something as a new new learner or a new person to the industry. Uh, so we agitated to have that plan and implement. So remove from uh, the, the unit outcomes or the assessment process and have words in there like, participate uh, in the process rather than plan it and implement it because in that implementation you actually have to take some um, take some control over the process and implement it and see to the end and and do that adjustments if, if required so I think um, I take your point on board Rajan and we do and did agitate to have a lot of those moved out uh, the BSB units the, the straight up business units are those have been taken out of the training package in the new one and uh, uh, SIT have written their own. So uh, there is some, some uh, change afoot in that direction. Yeah. Um, all right, well, I know that we've got 15 minutes left, so I'm just keeping an eye on the time. Um, I think we've covered off uh, a lot of those talking points that, um, that we sort of wanted to cover today from, from our collaborations and validation processes. Um, happy to open the floor up to more questions now if um, there's anything that anyone in the rest of the room would like to see addressed or, or like discussed. I'll just give a minute to see if anything comes through.
Yeah, while well, we're waiting further to that point, you know, the the straight BSB units, um, obviously because of their nature and and depending on which ones you decide to bring in for for you know hospitality qualifications, if you're bringing in ones that are built at the you know more at the the diploma level um, that are focusing on those management skills, then yeah, the the expectation for you to not only create something from scratch yourself being at the level of, of a manager but then implement it then monitor it then make recommendations for changes it's a process that you know from again if you're looking at it from a realistic you know competence perspective it's a process that you'd be working on for you know six months to to really play out the real world workplace version of it um, so trying to be able to to replicate those those skills in in a setting that can be simulated or can be done, you know, in a much shorter amount of time for the purposes of assessing that that unit and moving on um, is definitely a difficult one. So, and that's always been a, an interesting crossover between, you know, the SIT package versus the BSB package where BSB, all the units are written to the specific qualification levels, whereas SIT is a single unit can be used anywhere from Cert 2 up to Advanced Diploma and it's up to how you tweak that to facilitate it. Um, because it is the exact same unit code that, that runs across all those different levels. Any other questions coming through from anyone in the chat? I think uh, I'll just if, while we're waiting, I might go back to um, Dean Dean's question in the beginning where... Uh, he he asked about do other industries need to have industry currency? Uh, all all trainers in the vet space need to have industry currency. So if you're teaching uh, the business qualifications, the BSB uh, you, uh, qualifications, units of competency, you still need to have industry currency in those spaces uh, in against those qualifications in marketing, business, accounting. Um, you still need to have a, a, a touchstone in industry and how you do that is, uh, uh, yeah, how you do that, it, they also face their challenges as well. Uh, I suggested things like um, if you're in the business area, uh, sitting in on your strata committee, if you're, if you're a member of a strata committee in a block of units, going to their meetings or actually chairing their meetings and sending out the minutes or doing something like that. It does keep you involved with that business community in um, manage meetings, uh, 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 you know, de dealing with conflict in a strata committee can be interesting as well. So you can sort of get involved in different other ways, um, being a member of a church group and, and uh, having some um, input into the church group council or something like that is another way or a uh, volunteer work in a in um, an outreach center or even in uh, 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 what is it um, Oz Harvest or something like that doing some some uh, volunteer work in there we'll get some uh, industry currency across all things that just doesn't sit with the hospitality workers or hospitality industry or qualifications it's across the whole all all vocational trainers yeah um all right nothing new has come through from the chat um so i'll just start wrapping up and see if anything pops in while i'm going but um just want to say a massive thank you again for, for everyone to, to join us on this today. Um, as for those who are in the, the first uh, webinar that we did, um, will already know, um, there will be a uh, digital credential um, provided to, to everyone who's attended for this that, again, will contribute to your professional development and, and currency as well. Um, and we will be running a, a third, so the third and final in this professional development series as well uh, next month where I'm going to be taking a lot of um, what we've discussed today um, and all these findings from our collaboration um, and going through how we, um, as Learning Vault, have then tried to apply that to our approach uh, to the new SIT package. So with consideration uh, to the pressures for, for compliance and training and facilitation, different cohorts uh, that are 
in the, the SIT package, specifically for cookery. There's a huge amount of international presence there um, for the student cohorts. And so how we've tried to approach our design to the learning content, our approach to creating different types of assessments to be able to make that facilitation and training um, easier for the trainers, make the applicability for that easier for uh, different student cohorts to be able to interact with. Uh, and then also how we've been able to try and make that as, as realistic to and in touch with all of the, the different requirements and expectations of both vet space and industry in preparing these students. Uh, so thank you very much to everybody. Um, sorry, I've just got a couple of little messages that have come through. I was just going to say, Luke, also that, uh, you know, just on that note, the package that we created with Cookery also is fantastic in the sense because a couple of people earlier, I think, had a couple of questions about theory versus practical knowledge and the transfer of that knowledge. So uh, with the videos and stuff, it's a great opportunity for the student to be able to, to view those videos and see what's actually happening on a practical basis and then they have some kind of benchmark to relate that to when the lecturer or the trainer talks to them about the theoretical aspect or the same, you know, and then when they actually put it into practice in the training environment, that kind of brings it all together for the learner also. So that's a great tool that they could look up if they wanted also. Absolutely. And that's, that's all in the spirit of trying to make it easier for that knowledge and, uh, and information to be transferred to the student, but also as a resource for them to be able to look at, as a self-directed um, exercise and then be able to come back to and interact with the trainer about it for further clarification. So yeah, absolutely. We'll be diving into all of that in, in our final session. Um, and also as a, a last minute note as well, uh, for anyone who is attending the Bell conference at uh, the beginning of next month, uh, Learning Bot will absolutely be there. So please come over and say hi to us at, at our stands if you are attending. Um, but thank you very much to everyone. And I'm sure that uh, we'll see most of you on our third one in November. So thank you very much. And thank you uh, to Gary Fazan and Ness for, for joining us. Thanks, everyone, for joining today. Thank you. Hi, Luke. Thank you. When is this? Uh, sorry, Luke. Are you there? Ah, yes. Uh, when is this session that you said you guys are available on a stall somewhere? Uh, that is a very good question. It is in November. Uh, I don't know the exact date off the top of my head, I'm sorry, but I will find out and we can get in touch with you directly. And I saw your uh, direct message as well, Bala, so I'll make sure okay. that we uh, get that to you as well. Oh, that's all right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, early to, early to mid-November from memory. Okay. All right. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Have a lovely Bye. day. Bye. Thanks. Bye.